Welcome back. This is week four, lecture two, the observant movement. Now, this lecture follows very naturally upon the previous lecture, um, which focused on the great schism, because it's only in the context of the great schism that we find the emergence of what became referred to as the observant movement. And it was the observant movement um, primarily within the mendicant orders, but also within the Benedictines, which I'll say more about in a second, um, that was one of the major calls for reformation. And I'll explain that when we get there. Um, and one of the major aspects of reformation within the context of the reformation of the later Middle Ages. Was it then successful? Because I've talked about the reformation of the later Middle Ages having failed. It's like, well, yes and no, it didn't really change things, but we'll talk about that um, shortly in any case. Now, this is also part of your um, text analysis in many ways, because the observant movement arose only after Jordan of Quedlinburg published his exposition on the Lord's Prayer, which was 1324, as I mentioned, um, and that's the text you'll be analyzing. But when you look at the prompt, it also asks you to put Jordan's text in context of chapter one of my, of my Luther and the Reformation of the Later Middle Ages book, which I also address the observance issue, and then the Reformation of the Later Middle Ages. So that question is, what, was, what would have been Jordan's response in this context of the battle between God and the devil, which Jordan talked about, um, in terms of the Christian life? Now, again, I think I already addressed this, that that was, is, is my question, not Jordan's. Jordan talked about the conflict, the battle between God and the devil, and tried to um, show a path through that um, battle for living a Christian life. Um, and so my, the question of the prompt is saying, okay, taking that and analyzing the text, how would you respond for Jordan, had Jordan been asked the question? And then how would you analyze the text to say, based on Jordan's text and his response that you're kind of doing for him, to this broader context of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages, which includes then the schism and this observant movement, which grows out of it. Now, so that's kind of where that is coming from. But let's now stop and look at this observant movement uh, itself. And the term observant movement is both a historiographical term, but it's also a historical term. The observantia regularis it was a term we find repeatedly in the sources. We find it also early on, but in the later 14th century. And so if the schism is starting in 1378, it is only in 1385 that we begin to begin to see references to this attempt to bring about a true observ uh, observantia regularis, the observance of the rule. Now, observing the rule, we're talking about the monastic rule here. So for the Franciscans, it's the Franciscan rule, that's the rule of St. Francis. For the Dominicans, actually, it's the rule of St. Augustine. Um, and for the Augustinian hermits, it's the rule of St. Augustine. For the Benedictines, it's the rule of St. Benedict. And there was an observant movement within the Benedictines, uh, which is not unimportant. But the predominant focus for this lecture will be with the observant movement within the Augustinian hermits, because Martin Luther was an observant Augustinian hermit. And I'm not talking about how well he led his monastic life. We'll be talking about that in later lectures but rather he was a member of the observant branch of the order. And we'll be talking about this as we go along. But the earliest, as I just already said, the earliest documents we have for this observance stem from 1385 within the Augustinian order, but the other orders are somewhat analogous. Um, and it is an administrative split within the order whereby in 1385, the prior general of the Augustinian hermits gave permission to the monastery, uh, the Augustinian 
Hermitage or Monastery in the Italian city of Lecceto to be <coughs> outside of the hierarchy of the order, to be directly under the prior general. Now, this is kind of a split that we've seen before with the communes, which I talked about in terms of you know, the earlier high medieval communes, seeking from the, um, the, the, the king or the prince to be outside of the Episcopal uh, or outside of the, of the feudal structure to be directly under their authority. We've seen it with the, the new monasticism, which I direct uh, talked about briefly um, in basic structures of Christendom in terms of Cluny um, and then the Augustinian canons um, seeking to be outside of Episcopal control and directly under the Pope. Um, and the mendicant orders were the same way. They were directly under the Pope, not under the bishops. But then within the mendicant orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Augustinians, beginning in the later 14th century, there was this attempt by some individual congregations, as they were called, or individual houses, to say, rather than prior general, district vicar, etc., there's a whole hierarchy in the order too, we want to be directly under your authority, prior general, because we want to bring about a reformation within our cloister. We want to truly observe the rules and constitutions. That became the hallmark of the movement, a call for the observancia regularis. And actually, Jordan has a, a treatise which he includes in his um, Collectania Sancti Agustini, um, which is separate from his um, uh, exposition on the Lord's Prayer, that is... Observancia, the title is Observancia Regularis. So the, the term kind of was there before the observance, before it almost became a technical term for the observant movement, which became an administrative distinction within the orders. That's what we're getting at. Now, Jordan's text that he includes, the Observancia Regularis, is a pseudo-Augustinian text. He, he attributes it to Augustine. It's kind of a short compilation from several of the treatises that circulated as, under the, the title of the Rule of St. Augustine. There's a whole textual problem with uh, the so-called Rule of St. Augustine. I say so-called here because um, the Rule of St. Augustine has been shown, in my view, to be authentic. Um, but that is, that's like there's one version of it that is can be traced back to Augustine and authenticated. Um, but a lot of other texts were circulating in the, the later Middle Ages, or the, even the higher later Middle Ages, as the rule of St. Augustine, which were not. So that gets into a whole textual issue and problem with, with the rule of St. Augustine and its reception and use. In this, the Observancia Regularis in Jordan, he included what he called three different rules of Augustine in his Collectania. Um, this was kind of one of them. Um, but anyway, we, that's a whole other question. Even though it pertains, because if we're going to be observing the rule, what rule are we observing? But that's not the level that we're going to right now. Um, there were moves to say, say uh, administratively and uh, within the order of general chapters, which is like the official meeting of the entire order to determine that every cloister, every individual monastery of the order had to have a copy of the rules and constitution. That's not always the case. And they always did, but that was the stipulation. And because monastic life after the Black Death had really fallen off, with the population decline is understandable. So what we have is a lessening of standards, and I'll be talking more about this uh, in terms of the theology um, in, in I think the next lecture or so. But in terms of just sheer population, the mendicant orders all of the, were, were, were needing members because their members too were dying off. And so there was a, a relaxing of the standards. So you have all these people coming into the monastic orders that maybe really weren't cut out for it. Um, and that there are fantastic stories, or what I think are fantastic stories. Uh, we have the register of the prior general Gregory of Rimini. Um, and Gregory was one of the outstanding theologians of the Augustinian order in the 14th century. He became uh, prior general uh, in the mid-century, um, right as the plague was, was subsiding. 
Um, and so he's dealing with the real depth of the play. And one of the brother, poor brothers, Walter, um, had left the order and started living with a, a local woman in the city, somewhere in Italy. I forget exactly the same, uh, the, the, the city that it was in Italy, but in an Italian city. And brother Walter was living with it, you know, this woman and ended up having a couple of kids with her. And after having a couple of kids with her, petitioned the order to be, to come back to the order. Um, and Gregory, interestingly enough, said, um, brother Walter may return to the order but he'll need to do a pretty severe prison sentence before he can become, uh, be readmitted as a full member. Now, Gregory did not show any care or concern actually for Brother Walter's common law wife or his children. He didn't make any provisions for the wife or children. So he's just focusing on, on the brother, Walter. And you may say, well, what do you mean prison? Yes, the Augustinians, as did the Franciscans and Dominicans, they had their own prisons where derelict brothers would sometimes be sentenced to prison within the order. And Brother Walter had to do a prison sentence because, again, once you take your vows, once you take your final vows, you would, would not be permitted to leave. And I'll be talking more about that when we get to Luther's vows. There's a serious, serious step. Before that, that year and a day of being a novitiate, um, you can leave at any time. But once you take your final vows, you would not be permitted to leave. Now, you can say, well, why, why was Walter allowed to leave? He wasn't allowed to leave. He just left on his own. Anyway, that's but those, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. The discipline was very poor. We have you know stories of bro brothers fist fighting, um, pushing each other off of walls. I mean, it's uh, gambling and all these other. It's it's a wonderful source. These letters of the prior general, the registers of the prior general, because it's dealing with the daily life of the Augustinians in, in the kind of plague infested fourteenth century. I don't mean just in terms of the plague, but all the, the social problems that caused. You know, the religious life and the orders was really falling kind of apart into disarray. And I said, that context too, after the, the plague, and then after the, the Great Schism, we already have the papacy in Avignon, which was problematic enough, but then we have the Great Schism, and things just seem to be completely falling apart. That's the context of this observant movement to go back to the ideals of the order to truly follow the rule and constitution, to be a true observant. Now, so often this has been put in the context of late medieval reform, not reformation, just reform, and it was based on returning to these ideals of the past. And that's been contrasted with the 16th century Reformation. My point is that's really missing the case. Because we can argue, too, that what Luther was doing was re trying to restore the church to what it had been in the Day of the Fathers, particularly Augustine. And that the church had gone into disrepair, dissolute, and there were problems. And so we need to go back to the, the way it was supposed to be, should be, could be. And that was the same mentality as the observant movement. And so this, I think, is a completely false ahistorical distinction to make this distinction between late medieval reform as returning to this golden ideal, as opposed to reformation as in terms of changing things moving forward. The observant movement was trying to change things moving forward within this context of urgency that I've talked about. And they were doing so within the context of living their monastic life. Now, I've talked a little bit about this in terms of the pastoral theology and the efforts of the mendicants to reach to the people. I'll be talking more about that again um, in the next lectures, with the economy of salvation and, and so. But they were genuinely saying, we have to put our ship in order. We have to put our own house in order. And this is absolute necess necessary. And we are the, really the last hope for the church because we are truly going to be truly religious. And I've already said before, I think, if I haven't, um, I'm saying so now, um, 
that to be a religious had a legal definition. To be a religious in medieval Christendom, going back to the 12th century and thereafter, meant entering the state of religion, in statu religionis, which was meant entering a monastic order, or then later a, a mendicant order. So the way to be a religious was to become a member of the religious orders, the monastic orders. Your common person was not religious. That is a different kind of understanding of the term religion than what we have. What is so interesting, I think, and so important, and I see it first with Jordan, is that there begins to be a broadening of the definition of what it means to be religious, to be a true religiosus or religious person, or religiosa if you're female. It was not it was beginning to be no longer simply associated with formally entering a monastic order. But Jordan says every Christian should be a saint. Every Christian should be a religious, taking your own private vows to God, even if you don't take the public vows of, of joining a monastic order. And this is the, I mean, it's also been referred to as you know, monastic spirituality, piety, spilling over the mon monastery's walls. I think that is... I, it, it works sort of, but I think it's kind of missing the point a little bit. But what it's saying is for Jordan is that it's not just the monks and the friars who are the truly religious. Every Christian should be a true religious in your different ways. I think you said religion. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica said, is Christianity a religion? He said, no, it's a faith. Is there just one religion within Christianity? He said, no, there are many religions. Because the religion was how you fulfilled your religious obligations. It is what you owed to God. And how you went about doing so was your religion. Very closely associated with devotion even though devotion was a more broad term. So that is what is kind of happening. And within that aspect, and Jordan is arguing these things in terms of uh, every Christian to be a saint in his sermons, which are dated to the, the later 1360s on into the, you know, he dies in 1380s, so it's, you know, 1360s, 1370s. So it's already a time that, you know, it's post-plague. It's still pre-schism, except maybe for the very end, but that doesn't really apply to, to some of his comments. But it's in this context of the dissolution of discipline, the dis dissolution of rigor and of, of standards within the monastic orders, including the Dominican orders after the plague, and also then in society after the plague, the upheaval that that all caused, what do we do about it, and coming back to an understanding of how to live the Christian life. That was the key. How do we go about doing that? And that, there's a theological aspect behind that. Then there's the pastoral aspect of it. How do you teach people? What do you teach the people? How do you preach to the people? What, How they should be living and why? Those are kind of the big questions. And it's in that context that this, within the orders, this observant movement began. Now, that is kind of the broad picture. I went to look then at a number of uh, developments, including the origins uh, of this observant movement. And then I'll go from there, because the origins are also very interesting and also part of my you know, discovery in my own work um, that hasn't really been picked up that much. Um, but it, it's an, I think it's very exciting, because the origins have always been seen as being administrative origins. Um, there is, uh, from the early, early to mid-1980s, a two-part article by a scholar for whom I have the highest respect, Catherine Walsh. She's absolutely uh, amazing. On the origins uh, and on the Augustine observance in Italy, in this early congregation of Lecceto, and its beginnings and everything else. And she says one of the problems we have with studying this observant movement is that we only have administrative sources. And so we can't really date it earlier than approximately 1385. But I've discovered, or quite a while ago discovered, 
um, a text that I believe and have argued is an indication of the kind of bottom-up approach to the observance that it really stemmed from the friars themselves, as it did at Lecceto. The friars at Lecceto, the Augustinian hermits, they petitioned the, the prior general to say, we want to live a different life, that we need to be separate and distinct. And that separation was key. Because I think I already mentioned that the one of, one of the characteristics of the observant movement was an administrative split within the order, which I'll be talking more about in a second, or two or three or four or five, uh, or a few minutes in any case. But this text by Antonius Rampagolus, his Figure Bibliorum, um, which I have up there, uh, Antonius Rampagolus, all you say is Figure Bibliorum, 1354 and 1377, um, in my view, and my argument, is the earliest indications we have for the observance, the observant movement from the bottom up. You know, this is a text, fantastic text. Um, and I can tell, say a lot about it because I discovered this text uh, in graduate school. Um, and I've been working on it kind of ever since. The textual tradition is extremely complex. I won't go into all that background, but if you're interested, let me know, and we'll happily relate it to you uh, over email or if you have a Zoom meeting, I can tell you all about it because it was an exciting uh, discovery uh, and an important one that really hasn't caught on, um, even though I've published about it a few times and I will continue to be doing so until it finally does. Uh, I, I hope in any case. But Rampagolus was... Um, an Italian Augustinian hermit. He um, was working in, in teaching in Bologna, um, and he had studied, uh, I think, also in Pavia a bit, um, and in Naples. He was teaching in Naples. He um, was, though, uh, also teaching in Genoa. So he went from you know Naples to Genoa, um, and in Genoa, he then went to the Council of Constance and preached against Huss. Uh, he represented Genoa at the Council of Constance and was uh, even such, such an effective preacher against Huss, he was given the title Huso Matrix, the chewer up of Huss, the, the masticator of Huss. Um, we don't have his sermons against Huss. Uh, we have other sermons against Huss by other Augustinians, but we don't have Rampagolosis. But he developed this reputation as a, a, one of the most outstanding preachers of his age. And he wrote this book, the Figure Bibliorum, which is a handbook for Augustinian hermits for preaching. It is a, a source book. It is um, a, a way of saying if you're trying to put together a sermon, this can be a help. Now, it's not. There are also model sermon collections. And Jordan wrote three model sermon collections where someone could just take one and adapt it for the given situation that one was facing. But if one didn't want to use a model sermon or didn't have one available, if they had Rampagolus's Figure Bibliorum available, they would have the literal, spiritual, and figural interpretation of various biblical passages organized under themes. So the first, it starts out, and those are all alphabetical. So it goes from um, abstinentia or abstinence to Christus. Well, you say, well, Christus, this spelled with a C, yes, but it used the Greek X. So it is uh, the Cairo, is the Greek letters, uh, which we transliterate into XR, but it's, you know, Christos. The, and so that was the last uh, section of this Figuri Bibliorum. And you'd go through the biblical text and then you'd go through the spiritual interpretation that gets into. Um, issues of exegetical aspects, you give example at a time, um, and it provided the preacher with ready-made material, both biblic biblically and also as examples to fit into and create a sermon very easily. So if you want to preach on, you know, on Mary, um, there's a whole long section on, on Mary, the Virgin Mary. It gives you scriptural passages to use. It gives you their interpretation, what ones they're related to, and everything else. And it would be a great handbook to have. It became a very popular work. It spread a lot. It was published frequently. 
I think the last publication was in the 19th century. That's how popular it was. Um, it also was put in the index in the 16th century, but that's, we'll get there. We'll talk about the index later on. Um, it's a fascinating read. Now, um, the earliest manuscripts we did have of it um, was 1377. Um, actually, it was 1384, uh, but then there's a 1387 one. That's why I have up there 1354, 1377. Uh, and yet, there is an earlier one, which I discovered in the, the Hague in the Netherlands. It's a long story again. We won't go through uh, those discoveries. But this text is explicitly dated to 1354. And it is explicitly attributed to Rampagolus. And it is a very early and rudimentary, rudimentary copy of the text in textual analysis. It doesn't have all the same sections that we'd have later on, uh, some 20 years later, 20 or 30 years later. But it does have the, some of the basics, and textually it can be proved that it's this quote-unquote the same work. It also throws Rampagolus's um, biography into question, but that's, that's another aspect. And what one of the reasons I say that this is an, er, an early wit, textual witness um, to the observance is because there is a, a section, one of those alphabetical sections, um, De Religiosi, on the religious, on those people who live the religious life. And this section is in the 1354 manuscript too somewhat expanded and elaborated on in 1377 and 1384 manuscripts um, before it was printed um, in the later 15th century and on into the 16th century. Um, but it's still there. So it's like, okay, and what is it saying? It's saying there's a distinction to be made between those who live the religious life kind of perfunctorily, they just go through the motions. And those who are truly religious, the very religiosi, the true religious, who thoroughly live the life intended by the rules of the constitutions. This is to these religiosi, these very religiosi, which he says are in the the orders of the Franciscans, Dominicans, and Augustinians. He does not claim only the Augustinians as the truly religious, the very religious. But it's those three orders that, that form the, the key of the truly religious. He says, here we have it. In order to be truly religious, he says, the truly religious have to be kept separate from the riffraff, basically, from those who are not truly religious, who are just going to go about their lives. They join the order, they live their life without really thinking about it much. But we who want to be truly religious and are truly religious, we have to then be kept separate. Otherwise, our whole pursuit of being truly religious is undermined and infected by the discoli, as he put it, the, the undisciplined, uncaring profligate kind of people. He goes on to say, the truly religiosi are those to whom God has revealed the true meaning of scriptures. They are the ones that God has opened their eyes and revealed how to interpret the scriptures. And these very religiosi, therefore, are the only hope for the church because they are the ones that know how to interpret scripture. If you don't know how to inter interpret scripture, what are you going to do? Because that tells us what God is trying to tell us. And God has revealed that only to the very religious that must be kept separate from everybody else. So we should have our own houses, our own cloisters and everything else. And there's a rigor to this life that is in this context of plague-infested, schism-shocked shocked Europe was seen as increasingly essential. Now, Rampagolus does not, as such, call for a reformation. But what he calls for is the separation of the truly religious from the nominally religious. And it's only then later that we find the administrative split 
beginning in 1385 within the Augustinians with Volchetto, um, and then the development of a two-fold order, all underneath the prior general, but a division between the observants, as they were called, and the conventuals. And conventuals just mean the usual, normal, quote-unquote, average members of the order. And I have up here this diagram here, the institutional separation and, and conflict. We have up here the hierarchy, we have the Pope, the prior general. And if you look at the right-hand side, or as you're looking at the screen on your right, we have prior general and conventuals, the pro, uh, provincial prior, prior, and the friars. That was the traditional hierarchy, basically, within the order. But then with the observance, we have a split hierarchy, which we've kind of seen before. We have the vicar general, who would be directly under the prior general, who's directly under the pope. Underneath the vicar general, we'd have the provincial prior, and then we have prior, and then we have the friars. So there is certainly some overlap, um, provincial prior, provincial priors. But for example, there would be within Saxony, as we'll get to in a moment, um, there would be the conventual in Saxony with the provincial priors, so there are a number of districts and provinces. And then there'd be the observant congregation, the observant district. And there are several observant congregations, as they were called. In Italy, there are a number. And north of the Alps, there is the congregation of the observant congregation of Saxony. And that was about, I think there was one in Paris or in France, um, but I'm not quite sure. I'm pretty sure there was. So. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and check just to make sure. So there was a split between the Augustinians. I think I already mentioned after the schism, or in light of the schism, there was a split administratively too, where each order had a split prior general. So we're seeing this division and splitting up. And this attempt by the friars themselves to say, what are we going to do about all of this? We have to bring about a reformation in head and members. And for us, this means we have to be truly re religious because that's our only hope. Those are the ones, the truly religious are the ones that God has revealed how to live the Christian life, how to understand the scriptures, because that's what God's revelation is, but it's not clear. It's difficult. So how do we understand this text in the Bible? God has revealed that to only the truly religious and only God. That's what we're getting at, and that's the, the, the dynamics of this. And so we have these two branches within the Augustinian hermits and within the Franciscans and within the Dominicans and a bit within the, the Benedictine orders, and it causes problems. It causes tensions. Because if you're a conventual, the argument was... Um, you people are self-righteous. You you observants are self-righteous. First of all, we haven't don't really need to reform. We're already good. Second of all, self-righteousness is a sin. Wanting to be separate is a sin. It's called singularitas, and there are aspects of it that you know you think you're special. No, you're not. But here they are tr claiming to be special. So there's tensions and conflicts over this split that really emerges in context uh, of the, the schism and its aftermath. I mentioned that 1385 was, as the first example administratively ha we have with um, Lachetto in the 15th century. This movement grows, and it grows based under the label of introducing the Reformation. The observant congregations were congregations that were seen as having reformed themselves as Reformation congregations. And here we go to the slide introducing the Reformation. Um, it's based on this administrative split. And it is saying, if we are going to introduce and bring about a Reformation, what does that mean? It means within the order to introduce the observance. There are administrative structures for doing so. There are practical structures for doing so. 
And what it basically means is we are going to truly observe our rules and constitutions. We're truly going to follow Augustine, our founder, father, leader, teacher, and head. Now, this began to be enforced from above. Later on, including on into the early 16th century, we have you know, Giles of Viterbo, uh, the prior general of the time of Luther. Um, he's elected, I think he's elected in 1506. Um, letters from him chastising a given cloister, uh, Augustinian hermit cloister, and uh, Cologne is a major one. So either you undertake your own reformation or we will impose it on you from above. So this institutional split was really a, a, a reformation from above, even as I argue, with, we see with Rampagolas that it really, the origins of it is from below. This attempt by the friars in the individual location to say, we are going to reform ourselves. We are going to effect a reformation of this cloister, of ourselves. And if we can't do it, in the traditional structure, we're going to then be part of this new observant administrative branch. So when we approach the Reformation, the observant movement, we have to see that it was a Reformation both from below and from above. And that particularly applies to, in terms of the above, not only the order itself coming from the prior general on down, but to the princes and dukes and kings and everything within um, Christendom because they started, especially in Saxony, implementing the Reformation themselves, the Reformation of the Cloisters. It's been referred to as the Prince's Reformation, which is right there on the slide. Um, and this is not my discovery. But I hope you remember that I talked about this... Um, there's no conflict between church and state ever in, in, within medieval Christendom, but there certainly was a conflict between you know, lay power and clerical power and those two competing hierarchies. And the ideal of the emperor and the kings and all the way down, the lay power, the lay rulers, were that they were responsible for their subjects, spiritually as well as physically. Did all of them take their responsibilities seriously? No, but some did. And if you are a duke, I'm thinking here particularly of the Duke of Württemberg, um, a dukedom, a princedom within the empire um, in southern Germany, you want to provide the best. I, I just say this because I know most about it, but it also applied to other dukes and princes and kings and stuff. You want to provide the best religious life possible. So are you going to accept within your territory the conventuals when you have the option of the observance, the observant branches of the order? No. Why would you do that? And we have a whole series of letters, especially from Duke, Duke Wilhelm in, in Wurttemberg there, of introducing the Reformation. He says, we, I will introduce the Reformation of these cloisters. And I will affect a reformation within my territory, which really meant introducing the observant movement, this last hope for the church, by force from above, both with respect to the Augustinians, the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, and somewhat with the Benedictines. We are going to have a reformation from the prince on down, and if they don't do it themselves, I will do it for you. Because, damn it, we have to get our, our house in order. That became one of the big aspects of what did it mean to introduce the Reformation? It meant introducing the observant movement within the monastic orders. And of course, the observants, too, are out there preaching and teaching to the people. After all, they're the only ones that know how to interpret Scripture based on God's revealing it to them. This is the last hope for the church. We have to send in the Marines. That's what's going on. We don't want just, you know... In, you know, volunteer inscripted men in the army and women. We want the Marines. We want the Navy SEALs. We want those elite groups. That's what was going on in terms of the, the observant movement. And that mentality, the princes being responsible 
for the spiritual well-being of the, their territory and taking steps to make sure that they had only the best in introducing the Reformation into their territories as the observant movement is an essential precursor to understanding what's going to happen with Luther and with his prince, Frederick the Wise, because that mentality was there with Frederick as well. How do we go about understanding it and doing it? What's the difference between the Prince's Reformation and what was to come? Well, we'll get there when we get there. But for now, what I want you to realize is that there was this mentality in the 15th century, increasingly so, of the princes saying we need to affect and introduce Reformation in our territories. And that meant instituting and privileging the observant movement. That became known as the Reformation of the Princes. That preceded what was going to happen in the 16th century. Now, this brings me then to Johann Staupitz and the OESA Constitutions for the Reformation of Germany, um, which were constitutions that Johannes, Johannes von Staupitz, a German um, Augustinian hermit, friar, um, published in, in 1506, I believe it is. I have to go back and look. 1504 or 1506. He said, okay, if we're going to be observant, observant congregation within Saxony, the congregation of Saxony, the observant congregation of Saxony, which was the only congregation within the empire of observant Augustinians. And Staupitz was the head. He was the vicar general. Um, or at least the prior provincial. Um, the vicar general, underneath the prior general. We need new constitutions. And so he issues a revised constitutions. 1506, Constitutions for the Reformation of the Order of Hermits of St. Augustine for the Reformation of Germany. That was the title. That was the title. This was the plan for the Reformation of Germany was the Constitutions of the Augustinian Hermits under Staupitz. And Staupitz, as we'll hear later on, became Luther's kind of father confessor took Luther under his wing, and it was a very important figure for Luther. And he was the one that then tried to say, we are going to bring about this reformation of Germany based on the observant Augustinian hermits, these new constitutions for them. But he had a plan. Um, but there I said, Stralpus's plan was to unite the observants and the conventuals under his leadership. One of his points was, you know what? Um, great that we are observant. That's great. But should we just let, let the conventuals wither? We have this separation, but wouldn't it be better if we could bring it all together? So we have this plan to unite within Saxony the conventuals and the observants under his leadership. He says that way we can all kind of all be observant in some ways. And this plan was liked by another side. The conventuals didn't like it, and the observants didn't like it. It's like, hell no, we're not going to join together with the, the riffraff. If I'm a Navy SEAL, I'm not going to sit around and be joined with the, you know, the Joe Blow midshipmen. We're elite. So there's opposition. And the some of the observant houses in Germany realize we have to you know, oppose Staupitz's plan. And what we're going to do, since he's not really giving us any um, much credence, just pushing through with this plan, we're going to appeal over his head. We're going to send a delegation to the prior general in Rome, Giles Viterbo, to try to stop Staupitz's union. So they put together a delegation. And one of the members that was selected to go to Rome to stop Staupitz's plan was a somewhat recently joined professed friar uh, from Airfort named Martin Luther. 
In 1510, Luther and a couple of colleagues from a couple of the other houses um, make the journey to Rome to appeal to the prior general. This became Luther's famous Rome rise, his trip to Rome. Um, and all kinds of things happened there. We can talk more about that later when we get to more Luther particularly. It's, it's a fantastic story. All we know is that, number one, this delegation never was able to meet with Giles Viterbo uh, when they got to Rome. And we know that, most likely, there's no evidence that they met with him. They may have, but it's we can't prove that. Um, but what we can document is that when they came back, Luther was very much then a supporter of Staupitz. Not so much of the, the Union. The whole concept of the Union ended up kind of falling apart. But yet, Luther, rather than being an opponent of Staupitz, became one of his biggest supporters in his attempt to bring about a reformation of Saxony. As we'll see later on, Luther's trip to Rome also had a major impact on him. It's the first time he had been to Italy, and he was kind of scandalized and shocked by what he saw as the lack of piety of the Italians. But we'll get there when we get there. And that's kind of provides this some of this background and, and context. And Luther was himself, two years later, in 1512, um, appointed to be the district vicar over 12 Augustinian cloisters um, in Staupitz. Also um, had chosen Luther to be his successor as the professor of, of theology, uh, professor of the Bible at the University of Wittenberg, which had been recently established in 1502 by the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise. So Luther in 1512 is professor at the University of Wittenberg. He is a big supporter of Staupitz. He um, is therefore to the pastor of the cathedral church, the parish church, um, in 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 Wittenberg. So he has this pastoral function. He has an academic function, and he has this monastic administrative function. So he's really wearing three hats: professor, administrator of the observance in Germany monastic, and pastor of the people, which included not only being a pastor to his own Augustinian brothers in Wittenberg and all the students that were coming to study there, but also to the people. He had to take care of not just you know other Augustinians, but the people in Wittenberg. That's what was going on. And that's what we'll see how that all develops later on. But here we have this concept of the mentality of the observance as being the last hope for the church. The last hope for the church. This is in that context I've already talked about last lecture, I think the lecture before, and also already, already in this one. In the context of the post-plague, post-schism world, the sense was that we have to do something. It is urgent because we have earned God's wrath. And that's you will see when you read the Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, which I hope you can bring into your textual analysis of Jordan's uh, exposition of the Lord's Prayer in terms of that um, later impact of it and the context of it. Um, you'll see that urgency that urgency that we have not done enough we have to bring about a reformation we have to effect a reformation this is our last hope otherwise God is going to end it all which may be the case anyway because with what's been going on the last days are here and it's urgent not only for that but why? the last judgment if the last days are at hand, if the end of the world is imminent, we better get our shit together. Excuse my French. We'll be talking more about that scatological language when we get to Luther. 
that's what, so, uh, a phrase that he would have used, even though he didn't, but he used the word uh, frequently, but that's, we'll get there when we get there. Uh, but that's what we have to do. We have to get our shit together, or we're going to end up in hell. Because when Christ comes, how are we going to respond? What side are we going to be? When the horns blow and it's all over. This apocalyptic expectation increased this urgency of this is our last chance to bring about reformation. That was the observant movement. Both within the orders themselves and as they preached to the people and as Jordan was writing that every Christian should be a saint. Everyone needs to be a truly religious that's what has to happen. Now, did that become a reality? No. Does that mean that the Reformation in the later Middle Ages was a failure? It didn't effectively bring about a Reformation in the church. It never got to this position where, oh, we succeeded. We've done it all right. That's the problem with the, this whole concept of failure. I'll be talking about that later on. Um, the last chapter of my book addresses the failure thesis and puts it in historiographical context too. But when we say we have to bring about a reformation, what does that really look like? And how do you go about doing it? And what is the basis for determining success or failure? Those are the questions. But what we need to realize is that this is the tenor of the later 14th on through the 15th on to the early 16th century, not only within the monastic orders, but within society, as we see in the Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, as we see with you know, Staupitz and the New Constitutions, as we see with Rampagolas, and the origins of the observance from below before it becomes imposed from above. The urgency, the expectation, the hope for. And a reformer did come. And things did change. We'll be talking about that later. That's the context. Now, next lecture, I believe, I'll have to check, and I'm not going to go back and check right now, but I believe it's on uh, the late medieval theology and the economy of salvation. We'll look at some of the impacts on theology and on theological education of this post-plague, post-schism world of urgency and expectation and reformation. The reformation of the later Middle Ages before we ever get to Luther's reformation in the 16th century. Thank you so much. Good luck with your um, text analyses. I look forward to reading them. Um, if you haven't already submitted them and, and, and so, if you have any questions, just send me an email. Um, so keep in mind it's the text itself and then the, the context and the, the prompt asks you to put it into this larger perspective. Uh, so there's kind of a two-form basis for it. But if you have any questions, just let me know. We'll go from there and I look forward to reading them and uh, we'll continue. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.